Well, thank you very much, uh, Larry, for that, various, uh, for that uh, very generous um, introduction. And uh, I have to second the motion that we really have three of the uh, most, uh, most distinguished figures uh, on the subject of counterterrorism. You know, uh, I don't know if you all will agree with me, but I thought 2013, I thought everything should have calmed down by now. I thought the Arab Spring had solved everything in the, uh, in the Middle East. I, uh, I, I certainly, uh, you know, I thought, every, I thought Syria was well on its way to a participatory parliamentary democracy. I, <laughs> you know, I, I, I was especially optimistic about Egypt. I couldn't see how there could be any disagreement about what Egypt had to do next. Uh, and then turning closer to home, uh, we have had some, I think, really tough, tough challenges, and I think the, uh, uh, there have been a number of, uh, of uh, terrorism attacks that have been, I think, courageously dealt with, and, uh, uh, but um, I think uh, we have had some that have gotten through the net, and that was, uh, of course, the Boston Marathon. So it has been, uh, I think, a very, uh, a very difficult year. And now I think, to some extent, um, thanks to Mr. Snowden, who is, I guess, uh, usually uh, movies imitate reality, but in this case, we have reality imitating a movie. He's living in an airport. Um, <laughs> Tom Hanks had the role, but didn't right. want to do it again. So, uh, so we have, I think, a, um, a very interesting situation having to do with the overall um, with the, uh, the government's, you know, what is the government doing? How is it managing these issues? Uh, what is the future of this? You know, when you look at polling data in the United States, there's some indications that people are kind of growing tired of the issue. Uh, I don't think that seems to be the case in Denver, Colorado. I hope you all agree with me on that. So um, maybe I could start with, with Matt, Matt, who has really the key job, absolutely key job, of directing the National uh, Counterterrorism uh, uh, Center. Matt, uh, as Larry went through your bio, you've done an awful lot in, in, your, uh, in your career. Uh, and maybe before you tell us what the uh, N uh, NCT uh, National Counterterrorism Center does, um, maybe if you could also tell us about another sort of hardy perennial in this issue, which is uh, what is happening to Guantanamo? I mean, I thought the plan was to turn it into condos, but uh, uh, <laughs> apparently that hasn't worked out. So, Matt, if you could just tell us how the, what the uh, NCTC does and uh, actually maybe tell us a little about uh, Guantanamo. I think the audience would like to know. Sure. <laughs> you know, that and, and, and uh, Chris, we were, I thought we were going to talk about Guantanamo. I thought we agreed <laughs> before. Um, but uh, let, me also, let me just start by thanking uh, uh, the Cell and Denver University for, for hosting this and putting this on. Um, and I do think, I was the one who said, I don't think you could get a group like this together of this size uh, for an event in Washington. It's a real tribute to the Denver community that so many interested citizens have turned out to talk about this issue. And I do think your opening comments um, highlight what a dynamic time this is for terrorism and counterterrorism, both from the perspective of the threats we face and from the perspective of the government strategy to deal with those threats. Um, so very briefly, what, what we do at the National Counterterrorism Center, um, we, we were a post 9-11 creation. Uh, we were started really based on a, a pretty bold idea that, uh, that you could create a, a center that would uh, take all the information that's collected on terrorism regardless of where it was collected. If it was collected by the CIA overseas, um, if it was collected by the FBI inside the United States, um, and you could put it all together. In fact, you had to put it all together in one place to really overcome the challenges that the 9-11 attacks uh, revealed uh, in our counterterrorism effort. Um, and not only bringing the information together, but also bringing people together. So we're an organization that's made up about, uh, about half of our organization is made up of detailees from uh, intelligence community agencies from around the, around the intelligence uh, community, agencies as far flung as, uh, as FBI, CIA, NSA, as well as DHS, and, and then state and local agencies as well. Um, so our job really is to integrate that information, analyze the threat, share that information back out, and then 
beyond that to lead the government's effort on strategic planning in countering uh, the threat. So um, I'll, 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 I'll talk in a minute. I will talk at some point about Guantanamo. Okay. I did work on the, on the review of the Guantanamo detainees, and as folks may well know, the president in his recent speech at the National Defense University really uh, re readdressed the Guantanamo issue and, and pledged to, to work hard in, in the next couple of years to close the, the facility okay. there. Thanks. Jim, does any of that make sense? No. <laughs> uh. <laughs> well, I do agree about the crowd. So I'm actually jazzed. I've never actually spoken to a crowd that's been before. This is actually more people that showed up for my wedding. So I'm, <laughs> and I'm Italian. So when I'm saying that, that, that actually means a lot. So you know, I, work at, you know, I work at Heritage, so the think tank in Washington, D.C., and basically my portfolio is all things bad. So I, I do call my mom every day, and when I call her, she says, don't tell me what you did today. So, <laughs> so to actually get to talk to people about bad things. I, I would like to, Guantanamo is a good place to start. I've been there a couple of times, great beaches. So, um, so uh, you know, here's the problem. When the, you know, the president says he's serious about closing Guantanamo Bay. He's not really telling the truth, because he's not serious about closing Guantanamo Bay. Um, so you know, here's the challenge is you, you really kind of have to do three things. You have to have a place, and this was particularly important post 9-11, where you could pull together the high value detainees and really merge the information in a way that you couldn't do if you were interrogating people in 50 different places all over the country. So you had to have, post 9-11, we simply didn't know what we were facing. You had to have, collect that intelligence. So that was one thing you had to do. The second thing is you had to protect. You had to protect the detainees um, you had to look after their health and welfare, uh, and you had to protect the people that were guarding the detainees. When the last visit I went on, they said they have an incident every single day. Some of it's verbal abuse, some of it's throwing feces, some of it's actually, some occasionally, a, a physical attack on a guard. So everybody has to be protected. And then there were, the third thing is there are legal proceedings that absolutely totally have to happen. These detainees have rights and privileges that, that we are required to give them, and if we're going to convict them of a crime, then we have to do that in an above-board way. You have to do those three things. Guantanamo is about geography. You want to change the geography? Fine. Have a nice day. But you still have to do those three things. So when the president says, I want to close Guantanamo, He's really talking about moving real estate. It doesn't really address the core issues. The other, and I, I don't really believe the president is serious about closing Guantanamo, because if he was, he would have done it in his first term, um, and he would have put a lot of emphasis behind it, and he hasn't, and he's in his second term. And, and, and this is not him being disingenuous. I believe in his heart he would like to close the facility, but the reality is, is uh, Congress is controlled by Republicans and Democrats have put all kinds of prohibitions about transferring detainees to the United States. That ain't gonna change. And so the president really is just kind of blah, blah. It's just rhetoric. And, and the, the real challenge here, just to be frank, is there's actually two sets of laws. One is, or one is your authority to detain somebody who's a combatant. And the other is you want to try somebody for committing a crime, like a war crime. So theoretically, you could bring somebody to the American soil, and you could try them for the war crime. And if they're, if they're innocent, you still think they're an enemy combatant you could still detain them. Well, the reality is, is that would never happen. I mean, if we brought somebody here and we acquitted them, the, you know, the, we would just have to release them. That's a reality. And then you've got all kinds of issues about you, you probably couldn't deport them and there'd be all, all kinds. So nobody's really kind of figured out how to do that. So Congress isn't willing to step into the dark and do that. And, and so the reality is, is President Obama's going to leave office and if Guantanamo, the detention facilities at Guantanamo aren't still open, I'm I'm going to be really surprised. And you, you think that's a good idea to keep it open, I well, mean, given I, I, the alternative? I don't care. I, yeah. I mean, I would love to have, um, I'd love to have a condo in Guantanamo. I, but the, I don't care. The, you, you still have to do those three things. You have to gather intel. You have to protect people. You have to do legal proceedings appropriately. I don't care where the United States does, and they just have to do that. So in many ways, this whole debate about closing Guantanamo is it's a, it's a debate about a non-issue. Uh -huh. It's a debate about the least important point. Yeah. Where are they sitting? Sam, do you think it's a non-issue, this well, whole debate? Yeah, uh, and, and once again, just to echo what everyone has said thus far, which is thanks to the cell, thanks to DU, thanks to Larry Meisel, it's a tremendous opportunity to be here. Not my hometown, I'm from the Bronx, but my wife's hometown and the place I got married, <laughs> so pretty cool to be here. I want to, because I'm also from the Bronx, so all those people that just applauded for the Bronx, yeah. God, God bless I think them. they were applauding for the fact that my wife is from Denver, not the fact oh. that I'm from Denver. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think the following is true. 
and uh, it's going to, let me, let me be as blunt about this as I'm capable of being as a sort of detached, neutral, ivory tower academic for a living. Uh, Guantanamo is a red herring of an issue. The issue is not what to do um, with that piece of real estate. It's not what to do with the prison there. It's not even perhaps what to do with the detainees who are there. Um, that issue is nested in what I think is a much more important issue, which is what is the nature of the authority that the government possesses to detain people in, in keeping with its counterterrorism operations? Should we conceptualize a detention as being in the way of an arrest which culminates in prosecution by our DOJ prosecutors? Should we think of it as belonging to a totally separate category? We haven't made up our minds about that issue, and it's been, it's been a decade plus that we've had to think about it. Guantanamo is a kind of metaphor in a way, or the, the real issue at Guantanamo is that conceptual issue. The wrong issue is, or I should say the political issue is, what will actually end up happening with a piece of real estate on an island in the Caribbean. That is a red herring, I think, from counterterrorism standpoint. That's a hot political issue that I'll let the politicians deal with. When the Boston uh, bombing suspect was uh, apprehended, there was an idea uh, from a number of people in Congress that he ought to be put before a military uh, tribunal. Um, Sam, do you think that was something we should have been considering, or do you believe that the U.S. domestic uh, legal system can manage these things? I think the U.S. legal system can manage it terrifically well. We have veteran prosecutors in the Department of Justice. Matt was one of them uh, himself, uh, who have vast experience in employing, by the way, exceedingly, exceedingly uh, powerful statutes that Congress has passed over the last generation and has re-upped over the last decade or so. So we're not talking about kind of mealy mouth prosecutors who are going to go in and kind of celebrate the Constitution and see it as a gift to humanity to, to have a, a guy like Tsarnaev exonerated. We're talking about bringing a full court press of vast American power and resources those power and resources happen to be vested in the Department of Justice, <clears throat> not the Department of, or well, not the Pentagon or, or in the CIA. But that doesn't take away from the fact that our prosecutors are plenty capable of delivering results and of getting convictions and of putting guys away in a place that's probably even worse than Guantanamo if you're a bad guy, and that's Florence, Colorado. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Matt, you're yeah, going to have to follow uh, that yeah, one. So, well, it, well, Sam's absolutely right. I mean, in terms of the capability of the, of the criminal justice system to handle uh, the Boston bomber uh, in particular. Uh, I mean, Johar uh, Tsarnaev, in fact, was not eligible to be tried in a, in a military condition because he's a U.S. citizen. Yeah. Um, so that was not really even a serious argument uh, from the get-go. But beyond that, uh, you know, technicality about him being a U.S. citizen, um, he also, uh, you know, the, the facts are quite clear from the last 20 years in terms of the success of uh, the federal courts and, and, and federal prosecutors to handle terrorism cases. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a tried and true system. It's worked time and time again. There are the, 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 the degree of justice, the, the, the types of sentences, the legitimacy around the world, I mean, these are unmatched. Um, and the military commissions have been, uh, you know, moving forward in, in fits and starts. Um, I hope they're successful. Uh, I certainly do. But uh, there, there's really no comparison in terms of the capabilities of the two systems. And, and, and I don't think it was a very serious argument about the, the Boston the Boston bombers. To go, to go back to the, the Guantanamo point, I mean, the, you know, putting aside whether the president was serious or not, I mean, the, the reality is that um, it, it has been very difficult for the president to move forward because of the, in, of the restrictions, as Jim mentioned, that Congress has placed not only on pr prohibiting the transfer of, of Guantanamo detainees to the United States for including prosecution, uh, by the way, um, as well as detention, but also making it very difficult to transfer detainees overseas, uh, repatriate them or, or transfer them so to third countries. So countries like Ireland didn't want anybody back? You mean, that, well, some of these countries of, did take yeah. people back. In fact, in 2009 and 2010, dozens of, 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 uh, of de detainees did uh, go to either their home countries or, or for the most part, uh, to uh, uh, third countries. And that's on, uh, against the backdrop of the, of the years before, under the last administration, when 500-plus detainees were, were repatriated. So, 
the, the, the real issue is looking forward, what are, what are we going to look at in 5, 10, 20 years? Are we going to be talking in 20 years from now in a setting like this and have uh, 100 men in their 70s uh, sitting at Guantanamo, never been tried and never been uh, uh, you know, repatriated or transferred? Yeah. Um, what, you know, what, how do we not have that scenario take place? What do we need to get to do? What do we need to come together on politically uh, to arrive at a situation that, that that's not our future? Okay. So, you know, what, you know, what responsible politician would make that argument? I mean, that just shows to me kind of the, the, the banality of the political debate on this issue. They know it's illegal. I mean, they know they can't do that. So saying we should transfer to Guantanamo, they're saying something that they know that they wrote and voted for a law which prohibits them from doing. That's kind of nuts away. Okay. They, why would you send him to Guantanamo? Is he part of some vast conspiracy that you have to have him there to get special intel? No. Hey, I was don't he, make this stuff up. I was, mean, he, I know. was, he, of, was he picked yeah. up on the, in, the, in the middle of some battlefield in the Wild West yeah. where, you know, where, you know the, he was picked up in the middle of Boston in one of the, the most comprehensive investigations that we've seen in, in modern... Yeah. So, I mean, it just doesn't make sense other than somebody saying something, here's something populist that will really motivate people. And isn't that a really mature way to, to talk about Homeland Security, you know, 10 years after, or 11, 12 years after 9-11. Yeah. It's, you know, okay. stuff like that is really pathetic. Yeah. yeah. But uh, what do I know? Okay, okay. <laughs> well, um, you know, uh, Larry Meisel asked me to make sure I could find areas where these people disagree, and so far, <laughs> Good luck with that. you know, I'm 0 for 2 here. Uh, <laughs> let, me, let me shift a little, though, to, um, I mean, I mentioned that the Arab Spring became a sort of Arab thing that no one really understands at this point. But one thing that has happened is I think it's a little more difficult to have the kind of liaison we have with, with some of these previous, previous regimes, with these, uh, these new regimes. And I think the consequence has been fairly severe in terms of uh, the, some of these countries. Uh, Syria is an obvious one, but there are others that have become once again a kind of haven for uh, for terrorism. And I guess the question I have is, uh, you know, are we going to be up to that task? I mean, are we going to be able to have the kind of uh, relationships with these other countries such that, uh, you know, when people you know fly into a place like New York, are they are we going to be able to be sure we're able we're able to track some of these people, especially? from the Middle East. Sam, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I quite agree with you, Chris, that obviously the kind of macro developments in the Middle East are, are impinging on the practice of counterterrorism as they have to inside the United States. Um, let's take the example of Egypt. Um, you know, a month ago, maybe not even a month ago, I was talking to... Matt, in addition to everything else, you do have a sense of what that social uh, consensus is. I mean, from where you are in, in the... Uh, the White House near the president. I mean, what is your sense of uh, is that uh, is the American public prepared to uh, to do this or to continue? I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a bit humble about the idea of sort of saying where the American people are on these issues. I mean, I do you know. So I I do think that I mean Sam makes a very good point on the difficulty of measuring how successful we are. The to my mind, and and I think this is true of folks in government who work on this. We we basically take the position that you know we are successful when there are no attacks. So we take an approach of that we do not tolerate any um, anyone getting through. And when it does happen, like in Boston, uh, we look very hard at what we what we could have done better. And that's kind of the measure. Um, it's it, it, I, the sort of framing events for me last week were uh, we had a day where we invited. Uh, representatives, about 75 representatives from privacy and civil liberties groups to come out to the National Counterterrorism Center, talk about how we handle information, how we do the watch listing process, you know, that, that we keep track of known and suspected terrorists. Very critical of, uh, of the way that we do this, that we're collecting too much information, that we're not careful with it. That was Wednesday. The next day, Thursday, I, I was part of a, a set of hearings that the House Homeland Committee held where they were very critical of how we responded to the Boston attack, that we didn't do enough on Tamerlan Zarnayev, the older brother uh, who was identified uh, to us by the Russians, and uh, the FBI did an investigation, closed the investigation, he then traveled back to Russia. Why didn't we stop that? Why didn't we learn more? Why didn't we 
go get a warrant to search his house, you know, all the things that we felt, you know, I look back at that, we couldn't do, we didn't have enough information. So we're sort of buffeted in this way, and I think we gotta be flexible, as you said, Sam, we have to be pragmatic, but we also can't be, as an intelligence community, sort of subject to these wild swings back and so forth. We need, we need some predictability yeah. because we yeah. need to establish our course based on some predictable set of so rules. So literally between Wednesday and Thursday, you may get, see a shift in the public mood. Well, I experienced the yeah. polar extremes, yeah. I suppose. Uh, and now I guess I don't want to call either the ACLU or the House Homeland Committee extreme, uh, but, but uh, that may come back to haunt me in, in a number of ways. But the, that's, but that's I, okay. I'll, but, I'll do that for you. But I would say, so they do represent you know, strongly held views in, in, in our society such that I, I would, to your question, I think it's very difficult to say here's where the American people are on, yeah. on these questions. Yeah. To a very senior uh, former Israeli intelligence officer who was raving about the fact that the Brotherhood government in Egypt had actually done an exceptional job and a surprisingly good job from the standpoint of the Israeli national security establishment at staunching the flow of arms and personnel between Sinai and Gaza. Well. A month later, all bets are off, and we're essentially back to square one in thinking about how we're going to calibrate our security relationship with the current Egyptian government, how we're going to do so in a way that makes sure that the Muslim Brotherhood doesn't see this as a kind of end state such that they've decided that democratic politics are not for them and they're going to essentially pursue some other pathway um, to getting into power. So I think, yes, I think there's no way that we can do counterterrorism domestically without thinking about Egypt, without thinking about the role that Al-Qaeda and Hezbollah are currently playing in going out after each other in Syria. Um, the world's getting geometrically more complicated. Yeah. Jim? I... Well, I mean, the administration has a real problem here. I mean, and the, the, the problem is, is the Muslim Brotherhood are not good people. I mean, if you read their doctrine, their end state and Al-Qaeda's end state's the same. I mean, they, they advocate for different methods, but their goal is the same. And the Muslim Brotherhood, whatever you want to say, and they were doing some things in their own interest because some of those are Al-Qaeda guys and they don't like the Al-Qaeda guys, so they're happy to go after them. But the Muslim Brotherhood was trying to set up, a, I mean, they were trying to set up a sectarian version of Mubarak. It was one man, one vote, one time. And they were typical Middle East politicians is once you get in power, your purpose in power is to perpetuate your power forever. So they were just doing what good Middle East politicians do. But that was not a good government. It was not going to be a good friend in the United States. And it was not going to be a positive and constructive force in the Middle East. The challenge the administration has is it's got to figure out how to fight two different enemies. On the one hand, you have political Islam, which is not taking the Middle East to a good place. Because Egypt's number one problem is economic freedom. There's no property rights. There's rampant corruption. There's no growth. You have a huge population, massive unemployment. The Muslim Brotherhood is never going to deliver on that. And you have that on the one hand, and you have Al-Qaeda on the other hand. And, and we have to fight both of them, but we have to fight them with different instruments because one's really a political fight and the other one's really a fight against terrorism. But here's the great threat. Is if we screw, and Sam raised a really good point. If we screw this up, what's likely to happen is the disaffected youth of the Muslim Brotherhood are going to say, forget you guys. And for the first time, we're going to have them drifting over and say, we like this Al-Qaeda stuff better. And you could see um, potentially Al-Qaeda and the Muslim Brotherhood come together. That's a possibility, not the number one, I would think. You could see the Muslim Brotherhood deciding, you know what, okay, we're going to do violence too. You know, forget the ballot box. Or you could see, which might be the most likely scenario, is a, a shift in the rank and file in some of the countries in the Muslim Brotherhood shifting over to more Al-Qaeda-like extremism. But anyway, it's just not a pretty picture. Yeah. I mean, what is happening in Syria... I call it full employment for Matt, by the way. <laughs> but what is happening in Syria right now is it's the um, Free Syrian Army, there are about 10 of those. Um, and that uh, we have a situation where you know, Iraq, which had really seen violence come down over the years, uh, due primarily to the fact that uh, Sunni sheikhs in Iraq basically split with the Al-Qaeda uh, Sunni uh, uh, militants. And now you see this, this border with Syria, which had been pretty monitored, not only by us, but also by the, uh, by the uh, Assad government, is now porous again. Right. We're seeing uh, jihadists, if you will, come into to Iraq. Uh, we're seeing uh, a lot of, uh, of violence against uh, the Sunni population at the, by these uh, jihadists. 
and in turn, we're seeing violence against the Shia, uh, by, again, by these uh, Sunni jihadists. So we have a situation where I think Iraq is beginning to feel this kind of big time. And, uh, you know, whereas I think people always, uh, you know, on the one hand, in the Middle East, uh, they don't like what the U.S. does. On the other hand, they seem to want us to do more of it. It's like the old joke about a restaurant, you know, the food's terrible and the portions are too small. Uh, you know, they're complaining that we're not more engaged in it, and, and we're not. And so at this point, I, I kind of am looking at a, a free fall in Syria, which is uh, causing free falls elsewhere. I, yeah, so, you know, Chris, you know better than uh, most the complexities of the, the situation. I mean, having served as ambassador in, in Iraq, um, and, and I think one lesson from the last few years is that when we talk about the Arab Spring or the Arab Awakening, we, it's not one monolithic uh, set of circumstances. Each one of these countries, to your point, Jim, each one of these countries presents its own set of, of really difficult challenges. Um, I would say, you know, what we're seeing in Iraq is actually an upsurge in some of the sectarian violence um, uh, between Sunni and Shia. Um, but the, and, and, and Egypt obviously very complicated more from a political standpoint than from a, a counterterrorism standpoint right now. The, the most complex uh, country for us from a terrorism standpoint is Syria. Uh, in Syria, you, you do have the Free Syrian Army, the, the, the group trying to overthrow the Assad regime. But increasingly, you have the presence of al-Qaeda. And you have a group called the al-Nusra Front uh, in al-Qaeda, which is really seeking to become an official affiliate of al-Qaeda. And, uh, and then you have, on the other side, supporting the regime, you have Hezbollah. Um, and then on top of that, you have the presence of chemical weapons, um, making this a very, very difficult, uh, very difficult challenge for the U.S. Did you notice the that Taliban just showed up in, in Syria as well, opening up an office yeah. there? And, yeah. uh, and uh, beginning to launch operations. So the Star Wars bar scene is complete. Yeah. You know? yeah. uh, so the, so, the, so the, the real challenge for us is, you know, I mean, I do think engagement where we can is going to be critical. And, and that's true, particularly in countries that, that are going through their own period of, of uh, change and unrest. You look at, at uh, countries like Libya, Tunisia, um, Mali, which is seeking to hold elections. These are all countries, Yemen, I would add to that list, countries that are going through their own periods of change. Um, we have our interest in, in, in understanding the, the threat, just again from a terrorism perspective, understanding the presence of terrorism in those countries, and particularly how that threat might affect our interests. I, that, I think it's important to, to bear in mind that in a lot of these countries, in, in, these, in these regions, the threat is large to us, to the United States, is largely regional. These do not at this time present threats to us in the U.S. homeland, at least um, not on any significant scale. Uh, there is the concern that through the presence of safe haven and more permissive environment and diminished counterterrorism capacity in some of these countries that the threat to the United States could grow. Could you talk a little about the, uh, well, uh, uh, Jim, maybe I'll ask you to jump in, the, the, uh, the groups in, Le in Libya, terrorist groups in Libya, and to what extent have they kind of franchised themselves, not only in Mali, which is quite obvious, but also perhaps back in Syria and the Levant Let as well. Let me start with Syria and, and walk there, because I think it's, it's a problem, it's going to yeah. be Matt's problem, probably Sam's problem, because we wind up defending some of these guys in court, um, which, is, which, is the, which is the pipeline. We'll get to you, <laughs> Sam. We'll get to me. I, I guess my career as the head of intelligence at the NYPD makes me a softy in Jim's eyes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Or maybe it was my time in the <laughs> Pentagon. I'm not sure what he's referring to. We'll get to that, I'm sure. So there's, yeah. um, so there's probably about uh, 600 foreign fighters in Europe in, in Syria today, as the French interior minister said. So half of those are probably French and Belgian. But then you also have Norwegians, Danes, Italians, and everything. So this has become a kind of a tried and true al-Qaeda and al-Qaeda affiliate tactic. Is when a conflict flares up, is you want to get the foreign fighters in there, um, they, they do everything from their suicide bombers for you, but they're also dedicated leaders and everything else, and they're doing logistics and all that. But they're also, they're also kind of coming in and cheerleading for the team. But then they also become a source of, uh, that then could go, go somewhere right. else and do something else. So this is, regardless of how Syria turns out, this is a problem that Matt's going to, and the Europeans are going to have to deal with. There's at least 600 bad people who, if they aren't killed after Syria, whatever the way, they're going to go somewhere and do something. And we've actually saw kind of the same thing in Libya. Libya was actually one, I mean, we've actually seen it everywhere. You know, we saw it in Afghanistan. We kicked them out of Afghanistan, and then there was a pipeline to bring them back. Um, 
they were failing in Afghanistan, and, uh, and the Iraq, the post-Iraq period was really about al-Qaeda looking for an opportunity to get back in the game and, you know, and kill somebody somewhere. And so you saw these incredible pipelines coming actually then from Libya and other places up through Syria, dumping people into Iraq. And, and we've seen it everywhere where there is an openness and, and uh, you know, a shattering of control funnel the foreign fighters in to do that. And then we didn't see that in Libya, but then we did see that start to build up. And so you had a group, for example, which is al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb, which is every, was everybody's kind of joke terrorist group. You know, it's like, yeah, yeah. But, I mean, they were very impotent. And, but Libya actually opened up new opportunities for them. And among other things, we saw not just the attack in Benghazi, but we also saw this pipeline come into Mali. So, Jim, explain this, in explain this pipeline a little more. So you have a, a conflict. You have al-Qaeda or whoever declares some kind of jihad. So you start getting people from mosques in the UK, for example, and they feel that they need to go participate in this. So they show up in country X, whether Libya or uh, Syria or someplace. Get, they get um, more indoctrination and, and then go back? How does that? So, uh, well, they get, they get training and they get operational experience. And the most important thing they get is street cred. Street you, know, yeah. you know, I fought in Afghanistan, I fought in Syria, so you're a hero. Um, so the, the best example of this is a great place up at the military academy at West Point called the Countering, uh, Combating Terrorism Center, which did a tremendous report a couple of years ago with some data they actually got from, the, I think Chris probably got it for them. Um, but, so they, they went into this in Iraq and from um, the uh, uh, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, and basically when, every time a new guy came in, they did a survey. I mean, I guess you had to sign up for the health plan or retirement. <laughs> but, but, you know, they would, they, they would do like, you know, who is this person? Where did yeah. he come from? How did he get here? Who does he know? What, you know? what is his job? And so they actually have this really interesting analysis of several hundred uh, foreign fighters that went into Iraq. And, and, the, and, uh, and the occupations are hilarious. They're everything from, well, not hilarious, but everything from unskilled laborers to skilled physicians to massage therapists, well, I don't know what their beef is. Um, you know, I mean, you name it, farmers, yeah. actors, yeah. I certainly understand an actor wanting to do this, but, but it's, it's, an, it's an incredible, you know, it's just one conflict in one moment in time, but it's, it's an incredible illustration of this, of this capacity to, to set up these networks and find people who are angry and want to kill in the name of your cause and figure out how to get them to a country uh, uh, to do that. It's, it's a really interesting problem. But it's a pride, in, it, my point is, is it's a tried and proven tactic now. Yeah. They do this in every conflict, so it doesn't matter if they fail in Syria or not. Wherever the next one is, they're gonna do it again, and someday or not, they're gonna come up on, on, uh, on Matt's screen. Sam, probably New York City has been the biggest target, and in many respects, most successful at trying to identify these people. Talk to us a little about what the tasks are involved in that. I presume there's a lot of close work with the, the feds, uh, maybe even with Matt's own, own outfit there, but take us through that from uh, the NYPD point of view. How is that, how does that work? I'll do that. Let me, let me just kind of segue a little bit from what Jim was just saying about uh, kind of the foreign fighters and their flow into places like Libya and Syria. When I was sitting at my desk as the head of the intelligence analysis part of the NYPD and someone popped up on the radar screen and we were nursing some concerns about that individual. The key data point, I would say, that would distinguish really bad guys from wannabes was their having participated in the fight, their having received actual training you know, on the front, whether the front was Afghanistan, whether it was Yemen, whether it was Syria, Iraq, whatever. Um, the point being that there is a marked difference in the know-how and the capability and the determination of someone who's sitting in his pajamas and getting radicalized on the internet in the basement on the one hand, yeah. and on the other hand, someone who's actually put on fatigues and, or the equivalent of fatigues yeah. and taken up arms yeah. you know, on the real live and, battlefield. And this is where your coordination with the feds must be and critical. And this is where it's critically important yeah. because the NYPD's program, which is exceedingly robust, so robust, in fact, that the program is quite controversial and has been the subject of Pulitzer Prize-winning yeah. critical accounts and many Sam, lawsuits. we love controversy, so tell we us how it's... love controversy, so here's the, here's the controversy. New York, being the laid-back, sort of mild place that it is, decided, you know what, let's just sort of see what happens. No, in fact, quite the opposite. New York decided 
that it needed its own program and that it was going to authorize the NYPD, the local police department, to essentially spearhead a highly aggressive program that had two features. One feature was defensive, deterrent, um, hardening targets, sending cops around in police cars with the lights and sirens on, going around the city to project force. You guys may have been to New York recently or in the last decade and seen that kind of caravan of cop cars and expected that the President of the United States was <laughs> traveling behind. Not so much. Um, this is just something the police department does as a matter of routine. You might have also seen guys in, dressed up in SWAT gear descending on all sorts of iconic uh, places in New York, seemingly without rhyme or reason. Once again, that's part of the the show of force aspect of the program. But the program also has another dimension to it, and that's intelligence driven. And I gather that some of what we're going to talk about tonight has to do with intelligence and the legality yeah. of intelligence. But suffice it to say that domestic intelligence, I think, is probably the most difficult or some of the most difficult terrain policy-wise, po politically, and legally as well. It's very, very difficult kind of material because what you're talking about is not collecting on Syria. You're not talking about running agents in Iraq. You're talking about the possibility of, of gathering intelligence on folks inside your cities, inside your state, folks who are citizens, uh, folks who are entitled to the full protections of the law. And yet, and yet, it would be irresponsible, said Mayor Bloomberg, said Police Commissioner Kelly, it would be irresponsible uh, not to be as aggressive as the law warrants um, in figuring out whether there is a threat in New York. Yeah. Yeah. This was prompted not just by 9-11, but by 7-7 in London, the attacks that took place, um, what, about eight years ago now. Um, those were attacks that were carried out by British citizen subjects who had actually been radicalized um, in their hometowns um, in the northern part of England. So the concern was, hmm, I wonder whether the United States or whether New York City, the cosmopolitan place that, that it is, akin in a sense to London, whether, what, wonder whether New York City has a problem like that and what are we going to do about it. So the police department undertook to do a very vigorous job at gathering intelligence and trying to figure out whether there is a threat and if there is one, what's its magnitude, what's its, what's yeah. its particular dimensions. Yeah. And now putting on your current hat as a law professor from mm -hmm. NYU, how do you feel they're doing? Well, there are two questions about how do I feel they're doing. There's the efficacy point, and one of the hardest things in our business, being the counterterrorism business, I would say, probably the hardest thing is how to kind of come up with a real metric for success. Not a bogus metric, but a real metric. Yeah. Now, I take it a real metric is there haven't been attacks. I think that is a serious metric, but it's very hard to trace that result to any particular program. So the causal relationship. The causal relationship is, yeah. is I think, just incredibly hard, maybe impossibly hard. Um, yeah. to put together. Having said that, on the law, I think there are very sensitive issues that need to be worked out by our society. If I have any takeaway on the law relative to domestic intelligence or the law relative to NSA or any of the most sensitive issues that are out there, drone strikes against Americans, I think it's this. It's ultimately not going to come down to professional judges or professional politicians or professional national security experts. It has to come down to some kind of social consensus around these issues that needs to coalesce. There needs to be a sense in the public that the threat is significant enough to warrant this or that measure. And there also needs to be the ability to be flexible and dynamic. We need to be able to, to be aggressive in the aftermath of 7-7 or 9-11 and then to realize that once we've gotten the measure of the situation, it might be an opportune time to roll certain things back.